Welcome back to Maryland Morning on WYPR. I'm Sheila Cast. Fifty years ago, in the mid-1960s, Martin Luther King Jr. was drawing his movement's attention from civil rights to economic justice. The rights of the working poor cut across racial divides for King and his wife, Coretta Scott King. They saw the civil rights movement as intertwined with the work of unions to raise wages and improve working conditions. In the 1960s, African Americans were moving into cities as jobs and factories were moving elsewhere. Here's Dr. King in March 1968. For most of the poverty-stricken people in our country are working every day. They are making wages so inadequate that they cannot begin to function in the mainstream of economic life of the nation. They are working, in many instances, full-time jobs for part-time income. When Dr. King was assassinated a month later, he was in Memphis, Tennessee, organizing his Poor People's Campaign and preparing for a march with striking sanitation workers. Just days after his death, his widow led a march in Memphis with those workers. And a year later, continuing her work on the Poor People's Campaign, she came to Baltimore to speak to the Hospital and Nursing Home Employees Union, Local 1199E, which was seeking the right to represent hospital workers. Producer Jonna McCone picks up the story. Johns Hopkins Hospital in East Baltimore, even in the 1960s, was one of the best hospitals in the nation. And organizers working to improve the conditions of African Americans in the city felt a place known for its innovative medical practices should also lead the way in fair wages. To understand the connection between the civil rights and workers' rights movements here in Baltimore, I spoke with longtime activist Bob Moore, who was awarded an Unsung Hero of the Civil Rights Movement Award by the City of Baltimore Community Relations Commission in 2000. I also sat down with two members of the 1199 Union, Annie Henry and Laura Pugh, who met Coretta Scott King in the late 1960s. Bob Moore starts our story. I'm uh, Bob Moore, born in Baltimore over 70 years ago now. As a kid growing up in Baltimore, I was painfully aware of segregation and racism when I was about 12, 13. I went with a white friend whose father owned a garage. We went to the white coffee pot. We both jumped on on the counter, and then I was asked to get down. He thought it meant him too. But the waitress said, no, hon, you can stay. He just can't not sit at the counter. Great French fries, but my mother later, when I was trying to clearly understand, chastised me for going into a place you weren't welcome in. I became, I guess, a full-time activist in the summer of 1964. It was a group of uh, SDS, or Students for Democratic Society chapter at Hopkins and, and Goucher. We formed a thing called the Union for Jobs. Certainly, without jobs, freedom is kind of a hollow thing. My name is Laura Pug. I live in northeast Baltimore. I worked at Hopkins, John Hopkins, for uh, 40 years there. I am retired. 1199 involves in hospitals and nursing homes. They are throughout east Baltimore, west Baltimore, everywhere. 1199 had developed an ongoing relationship with Dr. King, and after his assassination, the relationship continued with SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Originally, was Dr. King's was the head of, head of the organization. And after King's assassination, I guess the union proposed to continue Dr. King's work on what had become his anti-poverty initiatives, to serve that mission, the union agreed to help lead a campaign to organize hospital workers. When the union came to Baltimore, the Baltimore riots had sort of changed the atmosphere in the city in many ways. My name is Annie M. Henry. I have been employed at John Hopkins for 45 years. The job that I do now, I've had it at least 43 years. I come from a union uh, family. My father worked at Sparrows Point for years, and he was a union man. That was in 1969 when the union came. I'd been employed at Hopkins for six months. I started there in April the 24th, 1969. 
And by that December, when the union came, I was ready to go because it was not a nice place to work. A lot of prejudices, a lot of, just a lot of hateful, mean things going on. We only went in certain doors, and that was Rutland Avenue. We were not allowed to go in the front door, the back, all those doors. And that was housekeeping, nutrition, escort services, and engineering. And that meant that we couldn't go up on the first floor. They didn't want us up there. This is the way it was, and you didn't change it because of this is the way it was. We wore yellow and white uh, uniforms and nurses' shoes. You had to be clean. Everything had to be clean on you in order to work at Hopkins. A lot of the managers and supervisors, they were very disrespectful, and uh, they they assumed because you were doing a menial job that you were an ignorant person, and that's not the case. Once the union came, it was a raise. You could see a few pennies. It wasn't dollars. You could see a few pennies. It was better than what we were making at the time. Coretta was co-chairman, or Coretta Scott King was co-chair of what was the 1199 National Organizing Committee. We got to go see her on our lunch break, and you had to take your lunch break, and you had to be back on time. But she spoke about nonviolence. She spoke about standing up for our rights. She spoke about women stepping to the plate. So people swarmed out the doors of Hopkins Hospital greeting her. Hospital management people stood on a second floor window peering down, but never thought sense enough to come out. When Coretta Scott King came, it was a lot of excitement. She spoke about uh, her husband, Dr. Martin Luther King, and she said that we was his favorite union, and, you know, we this union held a special place in her heart. And uh, she talked about how uh, we, with the management, could try to make it a better working conditions. And at times uh, when she could and her bodyguards and whatnot allowed her, she would come to the audience and, you know, shake people's hands and ask questions and whatnot. When they took the union vote, I hollered, I screamed, I, I prayed, I did everything. I was so happy that the union was able to get in John Hopkins. 1970, I was 19 years old, and I made $2.10 an hour. I would bring home $52 a week. And I learned that through this union. You know, we have to be together. If we work hard, then we should be paid hard money. In 2014, they were able to raise their wages past poverty. Now, that's how long it took them, from 1970 to 2014. That was Annie Henry, who still works at Hopkins Hospital, Laura Pugh, she retired in 2010, and Bob Moore, who's working on a memoir. That story was produced by Maryland Morning's Jonna McCone. We reached out to Johns Hopkins for comment, but did not hear back before airtime. Maryland Morning is an original production of your public radio, WYPR, in Baltimore. The show is produced by Matt Purdy and Jonna McCone. We have production help from Estelle Klein and Catherine Sway. Nathan Sterner directs and engineers. I'm Tom Hall. And I'm Sheila Cast. On this day in Maryland history, 1809, Edgar Allan Poe was born in Boston. He died 40 years later in a Baltimore hospital. We're back Wednesday. Join us then. <laughs>